Welcome to RCC at Home. Now, whether you're in our building or watching us online or in the comfort of your home or someone else's home, I want you to know that you're a part of a church that embraces unconditional love and acceptance. Last week, we left off with Jesus inaugurating a one-sided covenant. Now, this covenant was all on Him, yet it was for the benefit of you and me. And the thing about this covenant, it was very expensive. It cost Jesus His life. Now, you think about death. We're all hardwired to think in the lines to, to long for eternity. Just thinking about death can make you uncomfortable. Death is something we inherently go out of our way to avoid. And, and we see that with COVID virus, people walking around with masks because we don't want to die. Now, if you don't believe me that death's an uncomfortable topic, next time you're at a backyard barbecue, ask the person you're standing beside, hey, hey mate, what do you plan to get buried in? You watch. It won't take that long till they excuse themselves and find someone else to talk to. It's just, have you ever stopped to think, what would life on earth be like if Jesus hadn't come to live among us as one of us and establish his kingdom? Well, to state the obvious, we wouldn't be celebrating Christmas every year. But beyond that, when Jesus was born, history was split in two. Prior to the birth of Christ, most people worshipped multiple gods. They were mean and personal, incapable of loving, and yet gave a license to the powerful to do what they wanted to do. Jesus Christ was the greatest catalyst for change our world has ever seen. If he never came, we'll be still living in a world where women were considered nothing more than property. Slavery would still be rife and justice is something that could be bought and sold like a box of chocolates at Woolies. We looked at this last week. For Jesus to bring about these changes and the greatest change he brought about was the fact that we could have a relationship with God because the sin issue would be dealt with. And for Jesus to bring about these changes, he had to die. Death never seems natural, you know. It's always been the greatest sorrows of earth. The good news is because Jesus died, we need not fear the finality of death. When Jesus died on that barbaric cross, he removed the sting of death. It's just the followers of Jesus, and there were many of them, not just 12. There were many of them. They didn't know that the day their Messiah died. Most of them, if not all of them, held great hopes of a Jewish renaissance where Jesus would rise to power, take control of the temple, expel Rome from Judea, secure everlasting peace, and in the process, create a worldwide Jewish empire. As the sun began to set on the darkest day of history, the disciples from a distance mourned the death of their king. Life no, no, life no longer made sense, and while no one said this out loud, they must have felt a little bit ripped off, you know, I've left my business, I've left my family behind to follow this Jesus and it was just a mistake. We today have the benefit of hindsight. It's just 2,000 years ago, Jesus' followers did not. When Jesus breathed his last, his closest followers took off for the hills. There were, however, some others that we might call secret followers. We don't know what it was. Maybe it was guilt. Maybe it was regret. Maybe it was they just couldn't take it anymore. But there was one guy, one guy who took on the difficult task of burying the one that many people had put their hope and trust in. We're told that this all happened on Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. That word Sabbath is based on a Hebrew word to, to cease or to stop. The, the Jewish Sabbath began on a sundown on Friday, at which point all work was to stop. The time between sundown on Thursday and sundown on Friday was known as the day of preparation. And on that day, the day of preparation, the families would prepare twice as much food they normally would. They would, uh, they would not cook on the Sabbath. The animals would get twice as much food on the day of preparation, so no food would have to be gathered. And the same firework, they would collect twice the firewood. They did everything double the day before the Sabbath, so as to make the day of Sabbath a day of rest, where they could eat, celebrate, and celebrate the provision and protection of God. There was also a law concerning death on the Sabbath. Last week we spoke a little bit about this. There, there were 613 laws that made up the old covenant that God gave to Moses at Mount Sinai. And one of the laws said, if someone has committed a crime worthy of death and is executed and hung on a tree, that body must not remain hanging from the tree overnight. You must bury that body the same day. For anyone who is hung is cursed in the sight of God. In the way you prevent the defilement of the land, the Lord your God has given you, 
as your special possession. It was considered an abomination to leave a body hanging after death. Only the barbaric, filthy, ignorant Gentiles would do such a thing. We learn from Mark that not all the religious leaders wanted Jesus to die, for, for as evening approached, Joseph of Arifamea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. <laughs> According to Luke, the disciple of Jesus was Joseph, was a good and righteous man. He was a member of the Jewish High Council, but he had not agreed with the decision and the actions of the other religious leaders. John tells us that out of fear of his fellow High Council members, that he kept his faith a secret. It's just something has happened. And now Joseph can no longer keep his faith a secret. We, we don't know what that something was. Maybe it was the curtain being ripped from top to bottom in the temple when Jesus breathed his last. Maybe it was the sun turning dark and the earth shaking. Maybe it was the soldier saying, surely he was the son of God. We, we don't know. All we know is bef before, Joseph's de before Jesus' death, Joseph was too frightened to stand before Jesus. And now he was willing to risk rejection and reprisal. As a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, he had no problem getting an audience with Pilate. And once there he asked Pilate for Jesus' body. Pilate was sympathetic to his request, which doesn't surprise me at all. He doesn't think Jesus was guilty in the first place. Yet before he would allow Jesus' body to be taken down from the cross, he had to be certain of the death. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead. So he called for the Roman officer and asked if he had died yet. The officer confirmed that Jesus was dead. So Pilate told Joseph he could have the body. Now remember, Peter is telling the story to John Mark some 30 years after the event. Peter's in prison. He's about to be executed for his faith. So he has nothing to gain in making something up. I can imagine Peter going, John Mark, this is so important. There was nothing to be gained by lying about Jesus' death. Pilate's career depended on the execution of Jesus. The centurion's life depended upon his skills as an executioner and the accurate report he gave to Pilate. John tells us that the soldier pierced Jesus' side with a spear just to make sure he was dead. i tell you why Peter was, went to great lengths to make sure that John Mark wrote all this down. The same religious rulers who conspired to have Jesus executed started spreading all these crazy stories, rumors, you could say. They, they, they were rumors like the disciples came at night, you know, and they overpowered the soldiers that were guarding the tomb and they stole Jesus' body so they could keep this message of grace going. There were other rumors that were spread as well. Rumors like, well, the soldiers didn't do a good job and, and that Jesus was never really dead. He was just almost dead. He was nearly dead, and, and while he was in the tomb, he kind of revived in that beautiful, cool atmosphere. Even today, there are cynics that say Jesus didn't actually die. He just slipped into a coma, was taken down from the cross. Everyone thought he was dead, but in the tomb, he, he revived. Let's just look at that for a moment. After scourging, crucifixion, slipping into a coma, and having a spear thrust to his side, Jesus woke up, gathered the strength to move a two-ton boulder slipped past the men guarding the tomb and then disappeared into the vast underground network that later claimed that he had risen from the dead. That story is just not believable. Everyone knew that the executioner certified the death of Jesus and Pilate released the body to Joseph. According to forensic science, the soft tissues of a dead body, beginning at the eyelids, stiffened, stiffened from rigor mortis immediately. The process of rigor mortis accelerates if the individual has spent his last or her last hours in a strenuous physical position, a, a strenuous physical activity, Jesus hung on a cross in pain for three hours. So it stands to reason that Joseph and whoever helped Joseph to get Jesus down at the cross had to flex and massage his arms, which were set in an outstretched position so they could realign his body and carry him away. With time running out, Joseph brought a, a long, sheet of linen cloth. Then he took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in the cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of a rock. Then he rolled a stone in front of the entrance. After a long and exhausting traumatic day, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus' body was laid. Now, no one ever expected to see Jesus again. Peter was in the process of picking up the pieces of his life. He, 
He kind of thought I wasted everything following Jesus. He was going to go back fishing. Most of the other disciples had walked away from the careers and they didn't have a way to go back to the careers. I think of Matthew. He walked away from collecting taxes. It was impossible for him to go back to that business. So they all decided to try their hands at fishing with Peter. They were convinced there was no good news. And the death of their rabbi was what it was, bad news. The setting sun on Friday required Joseph and his guys to quickly entomb Jesus. And that upset Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome. Due to the Sabbath, these women were forced into inactivity. Mark records very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. At long last, they could do something. It was only embalming the dead. He was love. And here is deep conviction. But it was an adoration of a dead Christ. They were prepared to apply nearly 75 pounds of ar 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 aromatic resins to take the smell of decay away. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? The anxiety of these women was well founded. The stone that covered the entrance of the tomb weighed at least two tonnes and was rolled down a sloping groove to lock it in place. The entrance of the tomb was not designed to be opened and shut. It was designed to keep grave robbers out and wild animals out. It was never designed to be opened. But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell the disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as you were told before he died. The resurrection made all their cares and anxieties unnecessary. Jesus had created a covenant of grace between God and a man, and they didn't even know it. In fact, without a resurrection, they would have never known it. The Christian faith has always and always will stand upon the resurrection. Christianity does not stand or fall on whether God created the heavens and the earth in six days, six years, or 6,000 years. Nor does it stand or fall on whether there was a worldwide flood or not. Now I want you to hear this. I believe that the heavens and the earth were created in six literal days and there was a literal worldwide flood. Just the Gentile church of the first century that changed the world, they knew next to nothing of what we know as the book of Genesis. Christianity stands and falls on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And just as God rested on the seventh day after he made creation, so God's son rested in the tomb after he made a way for you and me to enter into a guilt-free relationship with our Father in heaven. And for the next 40 days, Jesus appeared to person after person and groups of people after groups of people. It was reported in one such meeting, Jesus had 500 people in that one meeting. They saw 500 people, saw the resurrected Jesus. Word was out, Jesus was alive. At long last, the penny dropped for the disciples. They understood what Jesus meant when he said, the time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. In this new covenant, God would not be tucked away behind a curtain at the back of a temple. In this new covenant, God would send his spirit, the third member of the Trinity, and his spirit would take up residence in the people that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He would be the, become the driving influence on how they live their lives. The covenant established by Jesus had just one more thing to do before he could return to the Father. So he gathered his followers together one more time. He wanted them to know, just like he wants you and me to know, that this good news is so much more than going to heaven one day when you die. The good news is that the Spirit of God is going to empower people to be God's representatives on planet Earth. Listen to what Jesus told them. Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. And that is why at Runcorn Christian Church, we have a vision that goes way beyond ourselves. 10% of our offerings go straight off the top. They just go to missions to take the gospel into countries and kingdoms and situations where darkness reigns. That's why yearly we do a missions offering that 100% goes to missions. But let's put the, just push the missionaries to the side for a moment. Let's talk about you and me for a minute. There is a power at work when you preach the good news, or, or put another way, 
There is a power at work when you tell someone what God has done in your life. God is not calling you to defend the good news. He's calling you to proclaim it. Jesus Christ is still the answer to the world and his blood that he shed at Calvary 2,000 years ago still forgives sins and it still changes lives. Jesus went on to say, anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now Matthew tells us that we're to be baptized in the threefold name of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. That, by the way, is not a slogan. It's not a jingle that gets added to a prayer. It's like a magic formula that makes God do stuff that we want him to do. Baptism doesn't even save you. It's God's grace, accepted through faith in Christ that saves you. To be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is to be immersed in the nature of God. We don't get this today, and the reason we don't get this is that our names have very little to do with our nature. Uh, you know, my dad's name, David, meant beloved one. My name's Wayne. It means maker of wag wagon wheels. Well, I can tell you now, I have never made a wagon wheel in my life. But in Jesus' day, your name and your nature were one and the same. That is why Simon had his name changed to Peter. His nature had changed. When God touched someone, then he gave them a new name because your name was far more than a way of identity, identifying you. Your name described your character. That is why we should be careful what we name things. God gives words creative life. And so the whole idea of being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit was not just a token ritual thing. The good news is you can be immersed in the nature of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In fact, that word baptized was a secular word used in Jesus' day. When a ship was in the water, well, that was one thing. But when it was sunk, they would say, the ship has been baptized. The word baptized meant before the ship was in the water, but now the ship is in the water. So the picture of immersion and baptized is like a, a white shirt when it's dipped in dye. It's been baptized, it comes out red. In other words, to be fully immersed is to be fully saturated. Now we're hoping, if we're allowed to with the COVID restrictions, to do a baptism in service in the ocean soon. And you'd be interested, please send me a text or an email. Now, not only are we immersed in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we're immersed into a thing called the church because we become part of the body of Christ. Just let me say one more thing. Baptism without faith will not save you. All it will do is make you wet. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. The good news of Jesus Christ leads to consequences. I know we live in a day and age where being confrontational is not a cool thing to do. I know that Christ wants to be uh, accepting of all people. I know that Jesus wants us to love all people. It's just Jesus clearly said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And we just can't cross out the rest of it. He who does not will be condemned. They get a load of this. I don't condemn you. You don't condemn you. Even God doesn't condemn you. It's their unbelief and rejection of Christ that condemns them. We don't like to think about this, but heaven and earth are real places and real people go to both of them. Don't let anyone tell you that Christianity is a behavior modification program. You see, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good and the nice people just can do what they want to do. Jesus came to make dead people live. And outside of Christ, we're all dead in sin. Well, he goes on, he says, these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. Let me tell you the signs that will follow believers are. They will cast out demons in my name. The good news of Jesus Christ is he sets people free. I don't know what's binding you up, but I can tell you this. Jesus wants to set you free. And they will speak in new languages. I know there are sects that say that if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not saved. And obviously, that is not what Mark is referring to. That's not in the scriptures. The point is, but there is a supernatural expression that needs to be followed, the reality of what we're about. God has a prayer language available for you. Paul picked up on this thought years later. and He said, you know what, guys? You're all struggling, but can I tell you something? I'm speaking in tongues more than you all. And I tell you what, when I speak in tongues, I, I'm building myself up. Have you ever felt that you needed encouragement and building up? Practice your prayer language. If you've never received what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit or a prayer language, today, get alone with God and ask Him to give you such a prayer language just to, to worship Him and praise Him. Let the Spirit of God empower you. Then they'll be able to handle snakes with safety. Now, obviously, we're not called to be snake catchers. 
years after this when Paul was shipwrecked on an island called Malta. He was collecting some firewood and he was bitten by a snake that grabbed hold of his hand and he just threw it off in the fire and, and nothing happened to him. The whole idea is God is sovereign. He's in charge of your life and he has the outworkings of it all taken care of. So have the courage to go after stuff. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. Doesn't mean you should start drinking poison. Jesus is saying, there may come a time when someone's going to try to do you harm. 2,000 years ago, when someone wanted to harm someone and take them out, they would poison them. We hear of that taking place every now and then in Russia. Kings and rulers at the time became paranoid about someone to try to poison them so that they'd employ people to taste their food and drink their wine before they would eat their food or, or drink anything. Jesus is saying, you don't have to walk through life nervous and fearful about what might happen to you. They'll be able to place their hands in the sick and they will be healed. We still believe that. That is the good news. The message, it transcends time and it transcends culture. That's why in every service, we pray for people. We believe God still heals people today. Hey, time's all but gone. Let me give you some takeaway thoughts. In the Old Testament, God chose the nation of Israel to be the light to the nations. They were blessed by God and they were blessed to be a blessing. They failed in that objective. In the New Testament, in the New Covenant, that responsibility has moved from the nation of Israel to the church. And guess what? You are the church. The church never has been, never will be a building. You are the church. In fact, Peter later on told us this. He says, but you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into wonderful light. That leads me to my second takeaway thought. What is God trying to tell you? Could it be there's an area in your life the Lord has been desperately trying to speak to you for some time, but for some reason you're just not hearing what he's saying? Jesus told his disciples time and time again, hey guys, I'm going to die for the sins of the world. Yet they're so caught up with their agenda that they couldn't hear God's agenda. They couldn't hear our Lord's agenda. So here's some homework for you sometime today. I want you to turn your TV off, turn your smartphone off, put away your computer, put away your laptop, put it all away. Get somewhere where no one else can talk to you and get yourself in a distraction-free place and say, God, then insert your name. Hey, it's Wayne Brooker here. God, is there something you've been trying to talk to me and I haven't been listening? Because if you are, I'm all ears. Just sit there, worship Him. Create some space and create some time. You'll be amazed what God will say. You'll be amazed what you'll hear from God when you create some space. While you're there, if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, why don't you ask God to baptize you with His Spirit? And if you have, when was the last time you spent some significant time just praying in that prayer language? It'll build you up, you know. There's so much happening in our world that's trying to pull us down. And if you don't have that prayer language, say, Lord Jesus, would you baptize me right now in your Holy Spirit? Would you give me this prayer language? Last takeaway thought. And this series will be over. God still heals people today. And He does so when we pray for people to be healed. You don't hear of God healing people that haven't asked for prayer. So if you need prayer, why not ask? And when you're just talking to people, if they say they've got a problem, offer to pray for them. You might be amazed what would happen if you just prayed for someone who has a need. Anyway, God bless and looking forward to seeing you next week. Thank you for joining us online at Runcorn Christian Church. We're continuing to grow our online presence, so please check in frequently on our website and social media platforms to stay up to date with the latest services that we have available. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video. To support the ongoing work of Runcorn Christian Church and partner in our vision, we'd like to invite you to give electronically. You can make a direct debit transfer using the account details that are on the screen and also on our webpage. Thank you again for joining us today and God bless.